Listen, we're in this series um, that Pastor Randy talked about, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and today, I want to take a moment to talk about what happens when good beats bad and ugly. When the good beats bad and ugly. Um, and, and so what better way for me to think about that is, is to take a trip back in memory lane. Um, and so you all get to uh, joy, enjoy this moment at my expense, okay? Um, it, I was going back to a moment where I had moved to a new town in eighth grade. I had left the town I lived in in Illinois, a big town, a multicultural city to go to a small country town in southern Missouri that was predominantly white and very different than the community I lived in. And so this was such a season of change for me that I thought, what better way than to bust out my eighth grade class photo and share it with all of you guys so that you can get a, a visual representation. Yes, there's me. It, it, look at that. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Uh, it disappeared somewhere. That's me in eighth grade. My wife has tried so hard to get me into better colors than brown. As you can see, um, I'm moving up in the world. So for all of those pictures that y'all dig out from middle school and high school that you, you try to keep buried, um, I try to do the same. And my wife hangs this one on the refrigerator so that everybody can see it when they come to our house uh, because it's one of her, her favorites. But that was me in eighth grade, a new kid in a new town that, that felt desperately out of place. <laughs> like, have you ever had one of those moments where, where that was you? Like, you feel like, I don't belong here. I mean, that was me. Like, let's just be honest. Middle school kids could just be straight up mean, okay? Um, especially to a kid in a small town who was new and didn't grow up with everybody else. And so for me, man, I wanted to fit in so bad. And I, I felt like I spent the first couple years there trying so hard and failing miserably at it. Um, I, in fact, my first year in eighth grade that I showed up there, I decided I wanted to play football. Except I'd never played football before ever. <laughs> and so, so I show up my eighth grade year and decide I want to try to play football. And they're running this drill. I don't even have a clue what I'm doing other than they ran a play and I hear the coach telling us to chase this guy down. Well, apparently um, we were supposed to run past him because that's what everybody else was doing. I didn't get the memo. I tackled him. Um, yeah. And, and so needless to say, he didn't like me very much in that moment. And he was really quick to remind me um, how dumb I really was. Uh, and it didn't take much because I already felt pretty stupid by the time I got up and realized what had happened. And it's amazing to me that, that those kind of moments happen in our life where we, we want to fit in, but we feel like we don't. We kind of feel like the outcast. And, and we have this moment in society. Sometimes we even have these moments in church, right? Uh, that maybe uh, you have been divorced or you're single and it feels like you come into the church world and everything is built for married people and you kind of feel like you don't fit in. Kind of feel a little bit like the outcast. Or maybe you get this diagnosis from the doctor and it seems pretty serious. And as much as people love you, they're not for sure what to say to you. And so they just kind of ignore you because they don't want to say something stupid or get uncomfortable. And you're like, surely that doesn't happen. It does. It happened to me. Like I'd have people do one or two things. They would say really stupid things to me <laughs> uh, or they would just ignore me because they didn't know what to say. If you just had more faith, Pastor Jason, Jesus would heal you. Come here, I'm going to punch you in the nose and we're going to see if he heals you, right? It does nothing in that moment to make me feel better, okay? But we say these things because it's just like we feel like we need to throw out these moral platitudes to try to ease somebody's pain that they're going through. And we only make them feel a little more ostracized and on the outside instead of feeling like they're a part of what's going on. We, we take these moments like this that happen for us. That maybe you hit a, a financial crisis and life has changed your financial situation. And all those friends that you used to be able to go out and do things with, now you can't afford to do the things you used to do before and those friends are nowhere to be found and you sit alone. Maybe there's a moment of depression or PTSD that you struggle with. And you want to find a way out of, of that mess that you feel trapped in. 
You've got an addiction that you keep battling that you, you want to find a way to let go of and get past, but people telling you just to give it up and change hasn't worked so far. And so because you feel like something's broken or something's wrong with you, you tend to isolate yourself away from everybody instead of finding a safe space inside of community. And there's, there's so much that we experience that I believe the enemy wants to use to make us feel bad and ugly. And yet, even in those moments, I, I want to take a minute to remind you of this. And this is what we're going to get into in, in Mark in just a moment, is that Jesus' goodness overwhelms our bad and ugly. I, I need you to hear me today. There is nothing so bad or ugly in your life that Jesus' goodness cannot overwhelm. And some of you are like, I don't, uh, I mean, I hear you, but I don't know that I believe you. That's okay. Just track with me for a little bit. Because I'm telling you, so many times, that's what the enemy wants you to believe. That's the lie he wants you to believe. He could do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for me. You don't know my story. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. You don't know how many times I've asked him to help me, and it hasn't worked out. And so he can't help my bad and ugly. And, and there's a moment in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus has an encounter with a man that was a leper. Not to be confused with a leopard, okay? A leper. Take the D off, all right? We're going to set it to the side for just a moment. Mark chapter 1. Before we dive in, can we just pray, though? I feel like God wants to do something today. And I just want us to prepare our hearts and minds to receive it. Jesus, we are so thankful for this opportunity to get into your word, to, to hear what you want to say to us. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would create a mind and heart inside of each one of us to receive what it is you want to do. To not run from you, to not hide from you, to not isolate from you with the bad and ugly things in our life. But I pray today we would find hope and a safe space to bring those things to you and see you overwhelm them with your goodness, Jesus. We ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 1. This story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Gospels there. It's, it's over and over again repeated. And so I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. It may read a little different than yours. You're welcome to follow along. But it says this, A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus. And if, that's what Mark says, but if you read Luke, Luke was a doctor, and so Luke gives us a little bit better description because Luke says that he was covered in leprosy, that it wasn't just one spot, but that he was covered, okay? It was very noticeable, and, and so this man came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. I love Jesus' response. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. And then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everybody what had happened. And as a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. And he had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming. See, there, there's this moment that I, I think we've got to get a picture of, of what leprosy was. Because when scripture uses the word leprosy, it, it's more than just the disease of leprosy. The reality is it encompasses all uh, of these skin diseases that people could have. Leprosy is one of them, uh, but it's one of many. Uh, and, and most of the time, those people that had one of these skin diseases that, that became infectious and could get somebody else basically had to leave the community of people and go isolate by them themselves. And so, so I have this picture. It's just one of, of somebody that had leprosy because the reality is the, the way it impacts the body is in so many different ways. Sometimes people uh, that have leprosy end up losing feeling in, in their limbs or, or the disease itself begins to eat away the flesh. And so they lose limbs as part of the process or they're covered somewhere in, in a very noticeable rash or outbreak of something. It's publicly humiliating. 
And these people that feel humiliated are outcast by society to a place where they can distance themselves from them, are left alone out here to figure out how to do life on their own. And, and so here's a man that society has said, you don't belong with us, you need to go out there. Here is a man who, who is feeling guilt or shame or embarrassment for the condition that he has because he's covered in leprosy. It's noticeable that something is wrong with him. And in the middle of being outcast, in the middle of feeling embarrassed, in the middle of feeling humiliated, he honestly did the one thing he was not supposed to do, and that was come to Jesus, come to somebody that was clean. In fact, Jewish law told them to stay away from everybody. But there was a man that was so desperate to change the bad and the ugly in his life that he was willing to place hope in Jesus and do something he was not supposed to do. And, and I love the, the hope that he showed because his hope was, is a two-letter word. He said, if. If you would be willing to heal me, I know you can. And, and in this moment, then, there is a world that feels like they are outcast. There is a world that feels like they don't belong. There are people sitting in this room today that don't feel like you belong here right now. There are people watching online that the reason you didn't come to church today is because you feel like you don't belong here. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus reaches out to the ones who feel outcast and invite them in to the party. That the world has this wrong when they try to tell us that the church tries to push people away because that's not what Jesus did. He didn't push people away. He made the circle bigger and brought them in. And so in this moment, there's a man that much like us that, that felt like an outcast. And we have these same moments where we feel like an outcast, that, that we may carry a disease differently than a figure, than an actual figure of disease that has dismembered us or changed who we are on the outside. But we've been labeled with something. We have been given a label that makes us feel less than worthy of those that are around us. And those labels carry guilt. And those labels carry shame. And the funny thing is, there's some of you that carry a disease that nobody sees on the outside and yet everybody sees. It's called pride. It's called greed. It's called arrogance. Selfishness. And some of us carry a disease that, that everybody else sees but we don't even recognize in ourselves. And we need Jesus to do something in our life. And so in this moment, for those of us that are struggling with something that's leaving us feeling on the outside, that, that we need somebody to deal with, how does the good of Christ defeat the bad and ugly of this world? I, there's three things in this story that I want to point out. So if you're taking notes, write them down, open up a note in your phone, follow along, um, because I can promise you this, uh, this is meant for somebody. Um, and, and so many times we think, oh man, there was a great line from the sermon last week, but I just can't remember what he said. Write it down. Okay, type it in your notes. It's all right. Take a picture of it when it comes up on the screen, okay? Three things, all right? The first one is this. Uh, do to beat the bad and the ugly in the world, move with compassion. You know what moved the heart of Jesus in that moment? It said Jesus had compassion. So many times when we approach somebody that feels like they don't belong, the first thing we want to do is point out the obvious of why they don't belong. Surely not me. Yeah. Can we just be honest for a moment, don't we? Or, or like we see somebody that, that seems like they're sitting on the outside and we want to tell them what's wrong so that they can get on the inside. We want to give them the truth before we take the time to care for them. Jesus took the time to care for them and get his heart right before he ever dealt with the issue. I'm telling you, if we're going to overcome the bad and the ugly in this world, we're going to do it because we move with compassion. We're going to do it because we can look at another person and we can actually see that person and not just see what's wrong with them. Man, so many times we can look at people and we can tell you what's wrong with that person. 
But we can't look at a person and simply see that person as an image bearer of God himself. Jesus didn't call us to look at people by their labels. Think about this. This man didn't even have a name. You talk about somebody who I, whose identity was made to feel worthless. We don't even know his name. You know what we know him by? The disease that he had. The leper. Imagine if that's how people identified you. Hey, that's, that's, that's the leper over there. That, that's, the, that's the sick person over there. That's the, that's the divorced person over there. That's the broken person over there. That's the drug addict over there. That's the... Imagine for just a moment <laughs> if that's your identity that everybody kept pointing out. Wouldn't make you feel very hopeful in that moment. But Jesus in a heart of compassion, looked past the leprosy, looked past the fact that this man wasn't even supposed to be approaching him. And he looked past all of the rules put in place. And he saw another human being that was created in the image of his father and he had compassion on them. What would happen? I'm telling you, what would happen if our life was driven by compassion. Not saying truth doesn't have a place, but listen to me. Truth is never a club to beat somebody over the head with. God's word was never meant to be a club to beat somebody out of your life. Hear me loud and clear. And if you think I'm wrong, bring me any scripture to prove me wrong, and I would love to have a conversation with you about it. I mean that. Like, I'm not speaking arrogantly. I would love to engage in that conversation with you. Because even as I read in scripture, in the moments where God would exclude people out, the whole point of why judgment and exclusion would come is because he was hoping that through that, repentance would come so that they could come back into the family. God is never about excluding people for the sake of getting rid of them. He is about doing all that he can to rescue them and bring them in. His judgment is driven by a heart of compassion. His judgment. See, so many times we've got it wrong. Like, oh man, the God of the Old Testament was so mean. I'm telling you, we have it wrong. The God of the Old Testament was driven by love and compassion for a people that he desperately cared for. And that love and compassion drove every judgment that he made. Because his hope was not to destroy a people, but to protect the people and bring people back in. But that happens from a heart of compassion. But you know what didn't drive Jesus? Guilt. Hear me out. Don't let guilt be your motivator. Let love. So many times when we want to do something for somebody, we do it out of our guilt, our own guilt, right? Like, I kind of feel guilty that I'm in a better situation than you, so I'm going to help you out because I'm really doing it more to ease my guilt than it is to help you. Anybody else? Like, you're making me super honest. Okay, nobody. I'll be honest, all right? Okay, there's one here. Thank you. I saw it right there. Thank you for being honest. Here's, here's how you know. Listen to me. Here's one that, that I've had the Holy Spirit check me on. And I'll confess, one, I'm guilty of it. Two, I've grown to hate it. But it's the perfect example. Listen to me. If, if you go to help somebody out and you've got to take a selfie of yourself helping that person so you can tell the world how great you are, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, your heart might be in the wrong place. And it may be more about you looking good to other people than it is about you helping somebody out in need. I'm just saying. Put yourself in that person's shoes. I'm a homeless person in need on the street, and I got to take a picture while you hand me a sandwich, and that's supposed to make me feel good about myself. Mmm. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think so. That's why I say some of us carry this disease of selfishness too. <laughs> Others just carry it a little bit more in the open. Don't let guilt drive your motivation. Don't let guilt steer the responses in your life. Because the problem with guilt in the end is it becomes all about you. And if it becomes all about you, that's wrong because it was never about you, it's about him. 
And so if we're going to move with compassion, move guilt-free. Move because God's just simply called you to love somebody, and you may have gotten it wrong in the past, but he's given you another opportunity to get it right. So get it right. And you don't have to take a picture and tell the world about it. Just do the right thing. We've been called to be a people moved with compassion, moved to care for those that are hurting, moved to care for those that are broken. Start with the heart. Hear me out. If, if you can't get your heart right, then work on getting your heart right before you work on trying to do the right thing. Because I can hear so many people tell me, well, I just, I said that because I know it was the right thing to say. Yes, but you said it like you were a jerk, and so it was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> if you say the truth, but they don't feel the love and compassion behind it, do you think they're going to receive the truth that you have to offer? Any of you that are married <laughs> or in a relationship, you know, right? Right? Do these jeans make me look fat is a loaded question. Do not answer it. <laughs> I'm just saying. We have these moments in these relationships where we know, man, so many times the, the truth just comes out, but the heart's not connected to what's coming out. What if we could get the two connected together? Jesus was full of grace and truth. It's not one or the other. It's both. You got to love somebody enough sometimes to tell them the truth and then explain to them where the love is at in that. But it's both. It's not either or, it's and both. And that's what it looks like to move with a heart of compassion. The other thing Jesus did is, is he created a touch point. Man, I got to keep moving. And by the way, I haven't forgotten about communion. All right, don't freak out. I promise, all right? It's coming at the end of message. Breathe easy. Whew, it's going to be okay. ADD, squirrel moment. I'm sorry. I don't know why it just popped in my head. <laughs> Jesus creates a touch point. Listen to me. If you want to overcome the bad and the ugly in the world, you're going to have to touch somebody. You can't care for people from a distance. That somewhere, some way, somehow, you're going to have to stick your hands into the middle of somebody's mess and get personally involved with somebody. That you can't hold people at a distance and say, I care for you. Because over time, they'll eventually see it for what it is. And so Jesus takes a moment to touch somebody that was supposed to be untouchable. They had rules for this stuff given to him in the Old Testament. Stay away from those people and don't touch them because you'll come unclean too. But in this moment, the person who was supposed to be untouchable, in this moment, the one that was supposed to be pushed out and rejected and made to stay away, Jesus said, come in, and I'm going to touch you, and I'm going to heal you. And get this for just a moment. Listen, Jesus didn't have to touch him to heal him. Think about it. He spoke, and a dead man came out of the tomb. He could have said, be healed and he would have been healed. Don't miss the fact that Jesus touched the person that nobody else was willing to touch. Because there is something powerful that comes when we personally touch somebody in their life. When we take the hand, take their hand, we shake their hand, we fist bump, we elbow if it's COVID, like whatever it is. We hug the huggers. We do what it takes. There's a reason because we're made for contact. Like, ask any doctor that's ever cared for children. There is literally a disorder for kids in the first few months of their life if they do not have personal contact with another human being, become detached. Why? Because we are created to have contact with one another. And the church is no different. You want people to say, oh, I can serve Jesus all the time. I don't need church. Yes, you do. Because we are called to do it together, to touch one another's lives, to hold each other's hands, to pray for one another, to care for one another, to be there for one another. And the only way to do that is to be all up in the middle of each other's lives. Amen. And so we've got to be about creating touch points with other people, okay? 
We can't hold people at a distance and say, I love you. We can't push them out at the edge or the fringes and say, as long as you stay in your place, I care about you. We've got to let them in. We've got to. You know, when somebody comes up and, and prays with me, one of the things that, that I've started doing, and usually I'll ask, because I don't ever want to make it awkward or uncomfortable for somebody, but, but when people come up a lot and say, hey, will you pray for me? Let me just tell you, that's usually an invitation to pray for them, like, in that moment. Not, yeah, I'll pray for you. And, and I'll almost always take their hand or put my hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Because there's something powerful that happens when one human being touches another human being. And we agree together on something. And some of you are sitting out there saying, oh, I'm an introvert. I could never touch another person that I don't know. <laughs> I hear you. All of you introverts out there, I, I hear you because, believe it or not, I'm one. I'm, I'm a trained extrovert. Hear me out, man. Anything extroverted you see inside of me is because the Holy Spirit of God has empowered me to be something I am not. So let's stop making excuses for the way we are. If you're an introvert, find one person, man. Find one person. Get out of your comfort zone. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. If you're a germaphobe, stick a bottle of, of like uh, something in there if you need to. So when you're done, you can lather it up after they leave. Not in front of them because you'll make them feel offended, okay? Get over yourself and give the Holy Spirit some credit to work in your life and help you do something you're not good at. And care for somebody. Look somebody in the eye and just acknowledge them. And keep walking. Like maybe that's where you start as an introvert, okay? But hear me, all you extroverts out there, listen, hear me out. Just because somebody walks by you and it doesn't acknowledge you, quit getting butt hurt because it's probably got nothing to do with you and everything to do with their personality, okay? <laughs> Can I say that too? I'm just going to say it. Like, I, again, I don't know if I'm supposed to say butt hurt in church, but I just did, all right? So listen to me. Quit making it about you. Just because they didn't say hi to you doesn't mean they hate you now and they're mad at you. It just means that they're an introvert and they're not comfortable talking to people. Or if you're like me, I get lost in about 500 thoughts in my head as I'm walking through somewhere, and I didn't even realize I passed you, Okay. So get over yourself, and if that offends you so much, then you be the one to show that person some compassion, and you engage with them first. Because it's like a telephone. It works both ways. And so many times, this is where even in these moments, we want to make somebody feel like an outsider. Oh, you're an introvert. You're such a terrible Christian because you don't want to hang around people. No. No. Because I know some of the introverts are some of the best friends in the world you'll ever have. Because when you make friends with one of them, I mean, they're going to be there to the end. They may not have a wide circle of friends, but they'll have a deep circle that they connect with. And instead of trying to make somebody like us, what if we learn to appreciate them for the way they are and give space to engage with them on their terms and love them and care for them and create touch points with them? Love on them, care for them. There's so many ways. Shake hands, fist bump. I got one person that I learned, like, during COVID, they just wanted to fist bump. All right, I'm good with that. They got the shot, now we shake hands. Like, it's all good. Um, I mean, we elbow bump. I got some people that still, like, I just want to elbow bump. All right, good, let's, let's go there. Like, if, I feel like a chicken a little bit, but, like, I can do this. Like, I'll get with you. Um, whatever it takes. Why? You want hugs, man? I got, I got 100 of them, and I'll give them away because they're free. They don't cost me anything. Sometimes people just want that. They just want that connection. Like sometimes I just want to run down the aisle and give everybody high fives. Like it's the football tunnel going down through there. But the camera crew would lose their mind because they wouldn't know how to track me down through there. And so maybe I'll go down the front row and do it and just give everybody a high five. 
Why do you think we have greeters out front that shake hands and connect with people? Because people want to be touched and they want personal connection. And if COVID taught us anything, it's that we were not made to be in isolation. And so if we want to change the bad and the ugly in this world, it starts with us being the one to go out and reach somebody and touch them and make a difference in their life. I got to get going, man. I'm going to be... Here's another great one. If I can throw this out really quick, all right? When it comes to touch points, here's, here's the greatest thing you can remember. The golden rule. Put yourself in that person's shoes and ask yourself what you would want somebody to do for you. Go do it for them. Put yourself for just a moment. Stop thinking about yourself for five seconds. Think about what that other person is going through. Think about what you would want somebody to do if you were in their place and then go do it. I had a moment where, where I, I went through some health issues for about three years of my life. And we had some friends from Kansas City that the kind of friends like you could not be around for a couple of years and then you just show up after a couple of years and it's like you are never separated. Those kind of friends. And, and in the middle of all of this that I was going through, one day I got a card in the mail from them. And they were just reaching out to see how we were doing, to encourage me, took the time to actually write it out. And they stuck a check in there and, and blew my socks off that they, they would even invest that much in somebody like me. But I thought that was a touch point. That was a way. There's so many ways. Pick up the phone and call somebody. Text somebody. FaceTime somebody. Write them a card. Get them flowers. Make them a meal. There's so many ways that we could touch somebody's life if we would just be willing to do it. And quit being so busy that you don't have time for those moments. Amen. The other thing Jesus did that's interesting to me, that this is how we beat the bad and the ugly, is this. He built community. This is what he did. Like, like he told the man after he was healed to go to the priest and offer the offering of healing why would he tell him that? Because that's what it took to come back into community. Because it was that moment with the priest where the priest would look at him and say, you're clean instead of unclean anymore. And so you don't have to stay out of the community. You can now come back and be part of the community. Listen, the church ought to be all about telling people that feel like they don't belong to come be a part of this community. If there's one place that the world ought to feel the most safe and the most welcome, it's inside of the church. And it's inside of a believer's home. And it's inside of your place of business if you're a Christian and you run a business. And notice that Jesus didn't put limits on who got brought back into the community. Because, see, that's what we usually do. Like, we'll have community with people that have the same beliefs that we believe. <laughs> I know, I'm about to step on a whole lot of toes here, so get ready. Jesus didn't wait to find somebody that looked like him or believed like him or thought like him. He said, I know that you're not part of this community, but you get to come in anyway. See, so many times we put qualifiers on who we let into our community. Jesus didn't do that. He had every right to look at him and say, you're unclean, get away from me, I can't do this. I'm holy, you're not, oh, gotta keep some distance here. Can't mess up a good thing that God's doing in my life. So many times we're afraid to step into the bad and ugly and Jesus just kept doing it time and time again. Because he wanted community with people and we gotta do the same. We gotta be willing to step in, even when they look different than us, even when they act different than us. Even when they have different skin color than us. I know, it's like, wait a minute, can we talk about that? We're going to. Listen, just because people don't look like us doesn't mean we can't be in community together. 
Don't listen to what the world tells you, okay? Come on. But you know how you get in community with somebody that looks different than you? You quit judging them and putting labels on them and you have compassion and engage in a conversation with them. You can't stand on opposite sides of the line screaming at each other about how you're wrong and they're right and get in a community with somebody. You can't stand screaming at each other about how each other's wrong and have a heart of compassion. Jesus didn't look at him and said, you're unclean, get away from me. Jesus looked at him and said, I care and I'm going to heal you right now. You want to care for somebody on the other side of the aisle? Quit judging them and have a conversation with them. And until you're willing to have a conversation with them, you should probably just keep your mouth shut. You want to talk about somebody that has something different ethnically than you and grew up in a different culture than you? How about we quit judging them and we just engage in a conversation and learn about what they went through and take the time to care for them? Instead of complaining about a border crisis that we don't know what's going on and we form opinions about somebody. We took the time to actually engage with somebody that's lived in another culture where they felt threatened or endangered and were looking for a way to better their life. Then you can form an opinion about that. But until you have that conversation, you have no opinion. You're like, no way, I don't know. Listen, my grandpa died of lung cancer because he smoked. I promise you, if you were to walk up to me and tell me that if my grandpa had stopped smoking, he wouldn't be dead, a couple of things are going to happen. You're going to feel an instantaneous pain in your nose. And then the next thing is, you're not going to be able to see because both eyes are watering. You're right, but you're wrong. Because what I need in that moment is not for you to tell me what my grandfather could have done different. What I need for you to do in that moment is to simply care about me. There's a world that just needs somebody to care about them. And the church has been called the most loving community in the world. And we ought to care about the people that nobody else wants to care about. Regardless of their skin color, regardless of their race, regardless of whether they're Republican or whether they're Democrat or whatever they are, we've been called to care. And if you're sitting there right now and and like steam's coming out of your ears and you're mad at me, hear me, hear me with as much love as I can say. You may have a spiritual cancer in your soul. Because if you can look at another human being and not see the value in them the way Jesus does, and you call yourself a Christian, there's something inside of you that's broken. Hear me, and I say it with the, the, as much love and grace as I can possibly say it. If we want to change the bad and the ugly, we do it with the good of Christ. And the good of Christ showed compassion to people, whether they deserved it or not. The good of, of Christ took a moment to touch people that nobody else wanted to touch. And the good of Christ brought people into community that most other people would want to push out of their community. And he changed this world and turned it upside down. Hear me, don't miss this. I know I'm going a little long. Just just stick with me for a moment. Catch this. Jesus was not supposed to touch him because the uncleanness of that man would carry over to a person that touched them. But Jesus touched him, and what happened? Jesus didn't become unclean. That man became clean. Hear me. That's what happens when the goodness of God invades the bad and ugly in our life. There's nothing so bad, there's nothing so ugly that the goodness of Jesus cannot overwhelm. And instead of running from the bad and ugly in everybody's life, we ought to run to it and be willing to engage with it because the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And that same goodness was not called and put inside of you so that you could run away from people that look different than you or act different than you that you're afraid of, but you were called to run to them and show them love and care for them and let the goodness of Jesus overwhelmed the bad and ugly in their life. Yeah. 
And that's what happens when good overwhelms the bad and the ugly. You want to change this world? Start living with compassion at heart. I had a moment a month ago. Some of you probably know this individual, and so I'm, I'm trying to... There's a guy that, that is, a, I'm presuming, a homeless man that lives around this community. I've seen him for years. I've been here five years, and I've seen him around here. And you know, I've passed him at the gas station. I've passed him around this town. I've found ways to look at him and look past him, not make eye contact with him. Until like a month ago, and I was going into Kroger. And there was this man digging through the trash can at Kroger. Pulling out people's Chick-fil-A bags and people's Burger King bags. Trying to find something to eat. And in that moment, I, I couldn't look past him. And I just felt like I got to do something. And so I went into the store to get what I had to get. I bought a sandwich. I bought some bottles of water and got some food and bagged them up in a bag for him and grabbed what I had to grab real quick. And I was praying the whole time, like, God, just let him be there. And I came back out and there, there he still was. And I walked up and just started a conversation with him. Didn't judge him. Didn't say, man, you're in this situation because you made some bad decisions in life. And if you just do something different, you could get out of that. I just started talking to him and took the time to care for him and hand him that bag of groceries. And you know what he said to me? Blew my mind. He's like, I can't take that from you. Have you eaten today? I'm like, I didn't even have to think about eating. I went to my fridge, I opened it, I go to my pantry, there's all the food I could want. And here's a man who's trying to find a way to get by day to day, and he's caring about whether I've had a meal. Because for once, I didn't look past another homeless person. And I just took the time to see a person and show them compassion and touch them. And really step into their community and care for them the way Christ wanted to. And those are the moments that he's called each one of us to. I'm going to get to communion, but I, I feel like we need to go here first. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online. And you have felt like you don't belong here. You have felt like you have made so many mistakes, so many failures. You live with so many labels in life that you have felt like the church is not a safe place for you. First of all, I am so sorry. But it is a safe place. And we are a safe place and care for you. And Jesus sent me here today to be his hands and his feet and his voice to reach out, to show you his compassion, to be his hand extended to you today, to say you don't have to keep running from him. You don't have to keep living on the outside of everything that's happening, but you're welcome into this circle and into this family. And it starts by simply accepting his invitation. If you're here today, and you've never given your life to Jesus before, or maybe you made that decision a long time ago, and you've just not been living for him, and maybe you want to make a new commitment to Jesus today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up so that we can put a Bible in it and pray with you this morning? Is there anybody? Okay. Oh, I see your hand. They're going to put a Bible in your hand. Once they put that Bible in your hand, you can put it down. Anybody else? If you raise your hand, would you, would you mind doing me a favor? 
Would you mind coming up here and letting me pray with you? We don't want to embarrass you. That's not our goal at all. But I just want an opportunity to celebrate and pray with you and the work that God's done in your life. Okay, that's all right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. You guys pray with me. How about that? (sighs) Say, dear Jesus, I need you to come into my life to forgive me of my sins, to make me brand new, and help me live for you. Help me feel part of your family and to run to you instead of running from you. I love you, Jesus. Help me to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I want us to do. We're going to get ready to take communion and then we're going to close. But I, I feel like communion to me is the perfect fitting to this message. And so if you didn't get communion as you were coming in, if you'll slip your hand up now, our ushers are going to make their way to you. We're going to get you communion. If you'll just keep it up and give them a minute, they're coming around. We got some hands here. We got some right back there in the back. Right back, right there. See, here's the thing that I like about communion. Communion is, is the perfect illustration of Jesus letting us see how much love and compassion he has for us. It, listen, you, you don't give your life as a sacrifice for somebody else if there's not a measure of love and, and sacrifice in your heart. And Jesus loved us so much that he wanted us to feel included into his family, that he was willing to pay the price to make that happen because he knew we could never pay it. And I just feel like this is a great moment to remember that and celebrate it together this morning. To be reminded for each one of us that you're not an outsider. The world may try to label you. You may feel like the enemy is trying to label you. But the only label that the Lord sees you with is his child. And that's the only one that matters. And that's what communion represents. His ability to bring you into his family and you be part of it. And so we have the bread that represents the body of Christ that that scripture tells us that that was broken for us, that, that it was by his stripes that he bore on his body that we were healed. Of all of the bad and ugly that we could never fix, Jesus did for us with his life. And that's what we remember today as we take this bread together. Can we do that? What I love about the juice is it represents the blood of Christ. That the scripture says literally washes our sins whiter than snow. It, Psalm says that, it, that through his blood, it literally casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. You know why he would say that? Because there's no point where the east and west meet. They're gone. That's, that's what Jesus reminds us in this moment. You can take all the bad and the ugly uh, that you still carry in your mind and in your heart that you keep putting on yourself, but Jesus says, my blood washed it away and I don't see it. All I see is perfection. You're like, wait a minute, I'm not. I know, but he is. And all he sees is his perfection on you. And that's what his blood reminds us of this morning. Let's remember that as we take it together. Can we stand all across this place? Mm-hmm. How many of you would say, man, I, I feel challenged by the Lord that either there's some places in my life that I have bought into the lies that I don't belong and I need Jesus to help me overcome those areas. Yeah. Now you keep your hands up. How many of you would say, man, I, I kind of feel convicted because I've, I've got some hidden sin. I kind of thought I was better than what I was and I've judged other people in a way I shouldn't have. Yeah, I'm gonna put both hands up because that's me. Can we just take a moment to give this to the Lord together and close out in this prayer together? Father, I thank you for every hand that's raised in this place, online, wherever they may be watching from God. We give these things to you because we wanna be just like you. May we be a people moved by compassion 
A people that's willing to touch those that, that nobody else wants. To embrace the unembraceable. To bring in to our community those people that feel rejected and dejected and feel like they don't belong anywhere else. May they find a sense of belonging here at Lone Star Cowboy Church. May we welcome them with open arms. May they experience your love and your grace and the power of your spirit to work inside of them. God, convict us where we need convicting. If we're going to be angry, Lord, may it be at ourselves because we know there's places that don't line up with your word and we need to line those things up, Father. Give us a heart to repent. Give us a heart to receive from you. And may we build a community together that's moved by compassion and is willing to touch hearts and lives, Jesus. And we ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. Listen, our prayer team is up here. If you want somebody to pray with you today, please come up. Let one of them pray with you. We love you guys. And we'll see you here next week.